Hello everyone and welcome to today's WorkSafe Month webinar, Just Culture in Practice. Is there a fine line between preventive and punitive measures? I'm Stephanie Mrowski from WorkSafe Tasmania and I will be your moderator. Before we start, please take a moment to read the following slide about information received today. I'll now go over housekeeping. Here is a screenshot of the attendee control panel. You should see something that looks like this on the right hand of your screen. You're likely listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to listen over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Webcams and audience microphones will not be used in today's webinar. Questions will be taken throughout the presentation please use the questions window on your control panel to type and submit your questions. Finally, today's webinar is being recorded. I would now like to introduce your presenter, Associate Professor Nectarios Karanikas from Queensland University of Technology. Nectarios is an Associate Professor in Health, Safety and Environment at the University, sorry, at the Queensland University of Technology. Before switching to academia, Nectarios served for 19 years as an officer at the Hellenic Air Force, where he worked in positions related to safety and quality management. He holds engineering, sorry, he holds engineering, human factors, project management and safety management professional qualifications, and he has, um, and he has been a member of various national and international associations. He has co-authored various peer-reviewed journal and conference articles with a focus on safety, risk management, engineering and culture, and he actively volunteers in a wide range of scientific and professional activities. Welcome, Nectarios. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie, uh, for the uh, kind introduction, and uh, thanks, Xavier, for uh, coming to the webinar uh, today. So, um, just to um, give a bit more uh, context, I arrived in Queensland uh, in early 2019. So I'm the course coordinator for the Graduate Diploma in Occupational Health and Safety. Um, and together with um, other five, six colleagues in QUT, we um, deliver actually um, a whole, let's say, set of course about health safety in the environment. I'm originally from, uh, from Greece. And together, I'm going to share with you um, some uh, thoughts and findings related to a study that we published a few years ago. Um, and everything I'm going to communicate today uh, are based on, on theory. So whatever follows, it's not just my opinions and arguments, but um, positions stated in the literature. Uh, and then I'm going also to move to the findings of the specific study. So if somebody uh, wants to summarize um, about just culture in organizations and especially related to occupational health and safety, um, we'll find out that it is seen as um, a component, necessary component in our occupational health and safety management. Uh, and also that having a just culture does not mean that we forgive everything. And on the other hand, the just culture must be uh, clearly defined uh, and not being just a matter of perception, uh, um, something that changes according to the understanding and the backgrounds and you know personal, let's say, perceptions and initiatives. And how is this culture positioned um, in the overall safety culture? So back in 2016, we published a conference paper, which we presented um, in the US, uh, following a, a project we had with the nuclear power plant. And one of the questions um, the manager of uh, that plant had was, okay, literature discusses about many aspects of safety culture. Um, which of those are most important, or in other words, if I want to start developing a safety culture, which could be the optimum order? 
and after reviewing the literature, uh, industry and academic uh, publications, first we, we found that whatever we try to do in organization, we need to have some common prerequisites, including leadership, commitment, um, communication um, internally and, and externally, um, also clear lines of responsibilities and accountability. So we need to have basic things in place. And the first thing that appears after we have those components is the that just culture, which we're going to present today. And why is this important? Because if there is a just culture, meaning uh, a good understanding of um, which behaviors can be tolerated, which ones can have some implications, as we're going to see next, then we can um, acknowledge flexibility in the working environment, meaning that we don't judge people uh, only um, about exceeding or not specific thresholds and uh, complying or not strictly with procedures and rules uh, within each organization, but we give them the space to decide, um, to assess, to evaluate and create. And if we have just culture and flexible culture, then we can hope to um, have developed or to develop a reporting culture, meaning that people then uh, start sharing with the organization, with the colleagues, through formal or informal channels, um, the, not only the problems in the working environment, which is the typical reporting issue like a hazard or, or, or a risk, but also how the within the flexible space and under the just culture, how the manage the variability within the system. What mistakes they made and how those uh, were compensated for by other colleagues, how they support each other, how they succeed also. And of course, reporting will lead to um, uh, information, will um, generate a pool of, of knowledge that the organization can share and of course the last uh, and equally important uh, subculture is the learning subculture all of those subcultures include excluding the common prerequisites are uh, included in the uh, well-known reasons framework but we just uh, let's say position them in a specific order now to share some experiences before going to um, to the specific study, when I was appointed as the chief engineer back in the Greek Air Force 2011-2013, a year after I commenced my duties, I thought it was it would be a great idea to uh, ask my uh, colleagues. I, I had to manage 100 people, and I was responsible for the Airworthiness of about 20 aircraft, and I would I I wanted to sense how um, it's going regarding my management and leadership, and what people would like to change, what they would like to maintain. So I, I distributed the questionnaire anonymous, of course, um, and I collected about 50, um, let's say, responses. And I analyzed them. I was quite happy with um, the results. Um, there were some comments for improvement, like, you know, I had to decentralize my management a bit. But what was really striking, because I hadn't included any relevant question uh, in the questionnaire, but there was a free text, you know, um, space, that out of the 50, respondents, about 30 talked about fairness and justness. And they say that we really appreciate that you try to um, to maintain this just environment, whereas sometimes it is inconvenient for a few of us, but we understand that this is for the common good. And this really uh, was an interesting finding from this short survey back then and made me reflect and think, 
okay, how can I, I do things better? How can I um, also explain to the people who do not understand what is justness in the working environment to, to come on board and help me to, you know, make more just decisions? So justness is something very sensitive and something that people appreciate in the working environment. So when we come to occupational health and safety, generally speaking, a just culture policy is activated um, when we have individuals or teams involved in a safety event, a serious incident. And especially when you have high severity events, um, those are the cases where the just culture policy um, is applied uh, most frequently. Of course, uh, in a theoretical basis, this should not be um, the priority. I mean, we should not just wait for the highly unwanted events to occur um, to apply just culture policy. So um, generally speaking, literature suggests that um, we should try to, um, to test the waters and apply whatever policy we have, even with the minor events. So to sense the reactions from the workforce and if needed, to adjust our policy. So what um, just culture policy is? Actually, it is um, an exploration and investigation uh, of whether the people involved in a safe event um, had any offended behavior or violated uh, rules intentionally. However, those, um, let's say, behaviors must be seen uh, within the context they occur, meaning we have to consider other factors, which I'm going to um, to cover in the next slide. So the usual practice in a just culture policy is that when we have unintentional errors or mistakes, we usually tolerate. I say usually here, underline the word, because once more, we must see those in their context. On the other hand, when we have deliberate violations, then in this case, we might have some implications. Now, the crucial thing when we develop a just culture policy is to consider the relative opportunity. Um, what I mean here, so starting from this first sentence, uh, just culture is not comparing performance against standards and rules alone. So it's not about drawing a line and saying, okay, you didn't follow that or you didn't achieve that, so you're going to suffer any consequences. This means that we need to check when we have indications of offending behaviors or violations, the degree of control the involved persons had over the unfolding situation and event. Because there can be cases that people just misperceive hazards or risks. Can be cases that we haven't provided adequate training and education to people. And adequate comes with the three basic parameters of quantity, of quality, and timeliness. So some, in some cases, um, organizations might say, yes, we have once a year or twice a year, we um, re-educate, uh, we inform people about development, about changes in organization, and um, we tick the box there, activity you know, completed, but this does not always mean that we cover the needs of the workforce. Also, it can be that um, deviations get normalized um, over time. So things that we, um, they were flagged as unaccepted uh, risks or hazards in the past um, when unmanaged and when actually accepted because we have delayed the implementation of any measures and controls, then those deviations become part of our normal life. 
also it can be cases that we have competing priorities and interests or the workplace is not optimal um, the physical environment the social environment the relationships um, illumination temperature whatever um, you can include under those uh, under this category workflow design which has to do with the system of work how it facilitates performance and whether uh, implicitly pushes people to deviate proper tools uh, proper equipment well maintained those are just a few of the factors that can inform um, let's say um, our decisions whether the uh, the person that or the team that is under investigation um, and subject to the application of just culture policy um, really had control over the situation and whether any behavior that in hindsight we see as unacceptable and, and offending and a clear breach of, of the rule uh, can be uh, somehow you know explained and justified how we um, establish a just culture and the policy of course we need trust trust has been cited in thousands of papers and tens of books and is the glue that keeps our society and our organizations uh, together so we need to um, to have mutual trust the employees the workforce needs to trust that managers have good intentions they're not there just to point the figure and blame and on the other hand the managers need to trust the employees about their veracity and, and honesty and we must be quite sure that there is a continual effort to listen to the workforce to uh, consider seriously any reports and any minor events in the past to improve systems before it is time to apply the dust culture and somehow we must um, instill across the organization the, the reality that uh, sometimes our uh, actions and behaviors uh, might have ripple effects outside our local environment and can affect the larger populations, can affect customers, can affect the public sometimes. So the literature suggests that when it is time to apply the just culture policy, um, this should happen with the participation with a group from management and peers. So we need to have different perspectives and different understanding of the situation. Um, so the peers will give more context uh, in, in the discussions about the culture, a policy application, and management of course they will bring their own views there everyone must be respected and of course each case is different it doesn't mean that because something similar happened as an event as an outcome or during the same process a few months ago uh, that we're going to copy paste uh, the decision making process from that case to uh, the case of today so yeah it needs more resources it needs more time um, but this is the suggested pathway also the how uh, comes to who is the target and nobody can be exempt from the just culture policy if we apply the just culture uh, culture policy only to the end users then it's not the just culture policy it's just a policy targeted only to a specific cohort of the workforce. Um, equally important, um, although it seems it sounds difficult, just culture is not there to develop behaviors, it's to discourage behaviors. That's why it must be clear. And the just culture policy means that we listen to the workforce, we try to understand if there were any attempts to compensate for what uh, was going on during the event 
um, and also to see the overall performance of a specific demotivated region in the past, because I don't think that any one of us here today would um, appreciate a negative judgment based on one single failure in our lives and not, you know, the people around seeing our, you know, um, performance over time, our contributions to the profession, to our companies, to the society. And now there are other three areas that intersect with just cultural policy, which are not mutually exclusive, meaning that just culture must be combined with substantive justice, meaning that during this examination of things, we need to, to reflect and we need to ask and we need to assess whether the rules applicable to the specific case were really applicable, whether um, there can be deviations because the rules cannot capture the reality, which is the case. Um, uh, to my experience, uh, you know, across many circumstances. Procedural justice has to do with clear procedures, um, how the just culture policy will be applied and when and who is going to get involved. And also, um, we should not forget the uh, concept of uh, restorative justice. So, we don't want to stigmatize people, and we also want to to care about people involved in accidents. It's not um, the only aim to apply justice somewhere, just to decide whether we should, let's say, forgive something or uh, we should apply any measure to an individual or a group but also help the specific persons um, to get back to, to work, to uh, avoid any long-term implications of their involvement. Most of the persons involved in unfavorable events really feel bad after that. They realize that they might have contributed negatively in a situation, um, and they still need our support. Um, and in this, in this context, we should not see just culture in isolation. And what if not? Well, we have the two extremes. So people uh, can get afraid of uh, implications uh, when we don't have justice. Or if we have a just culture policy that forgives everything, then they became, uh, can become really uh, complacent. And if not, having a just cultural policy means that maybe people are not going to report uh, in both extreme cases, because if they uh, are afraid, then they say, okay, I'm going here to expose myself, and I don't want to. And on the other hand, if they're complacent, then say, why are you reporting? Uh, there's no reason. Um, to report. Um, also, we're going to have lost learning opportunities. Uh, people will not open up, will not talk honestly, will not speak um, um, about what happened to them, um, either informally or during internal investigations. And also, we might have second victim, as nice Professor Decker um, states in his uh, one of his books, um, and stigmatize people. So before moving to the specific study to, to share that, um, ideally, as a, every policy, just culture policy must be shaped through a bottom-up um, channel, because if there is no agreed framework, even a fair you know, penalty implication uh, can be perceived negatively and can affect the relationships between management and, and employees. And also, if there is inconsistency of what measures can be applied or when forgiveness uh, is granted to, you know, uh, across different departments, different sections and units, then this will not convey a positive message to the workforce. 
So the question we tried to answer to the specific study was whether um, and how we can respect different perspectives when we establish a, a just culture policy and if it's feasible to, to have measures that are commonly agreed and defined across an organization. So what uh, the objectives were, we um, wanted to, to see the perceptions of employees, um, whether specific uh, set of measures were of punitive or preventive character, and to see whether the just culture policy could have a set of measures clearly defined and agreed. So the, the study was um, executed in the European Aviation Organization. They, the specific organization had separated safety investigations from administrative ones, but our understanding was that the administrative ones were expecting from the result of safety investigations to take ideas and, and you know, steer the, uh, their focus. Um, so there was actually, uh, no set of criteria when possible measures could be applied to employees. So the decision making in this case um, was based uh, merely on the uh, perception of managers. There was no just culture policy in place. There were um, there was let's say a room for managers to assess whether somebody should be forgiven or uh, should let's say be subject to any measures. And the research outline, we um, developed a questionnaire um, to collect perceptions. So we asked the organization around before starting uh, the, the survey what measures the manager have applied um, um, so far. And we wanted to ask people um, the perceptions um, about those measures, punitive or preventive, to add any comments and suggest any other measures. So we also accepted that we cannot accommodate everyone and we say, okay, if 80% or more of people agree with um, a specific measure, then we can safely say it is accepted. We cannot keep everyone happy and this is reality. So we use this generic statement to, to do um, our survey. So that was in the beginning of um, the questionnaire before the questions themselves. Um, and we say to them, there's a list of measures following. Um, imagine that somebody is involved in, in an, a favorable event and despite the contribution of any other uh, factors that must uh, be investigated and considered, please let us know in its case of error or violation, whether you see the specific measure of punitive or uh, preventive. So this is the list of measures. This is what the specific organization um, was applying. Um, it doesn't uh, have to be that all organizations must have a list of 12 or 10 or uh, five similar measures, just what the specific company was doing. Um, regardless of any of us saying, oh, this is unfair or unfair, or oh, this is very harsh, or this is very um, loose, um, lenient, um, it doesn't matter. This is what they were doing. So when we asked people about the specific um, set of measures in case of uh, committing an error, those are the results we got. So as you can see, measures, um, let's say, 2, 3, and 8 to 12 were seen as more punitive, and measures 1, 4, 5, 6, and 7 were seen uh, more as preventive. However, getting back to the threshold of 20%, we see that there were divergent uh, views of employees regarding the measures one, two, and seven. So if you look um, at the list on the right, uh, movement to another position within the department or the specific unit, and 
delivery of a presentation about conditions and reasons, like you know, sharing um, experiences from the event with others as a measure, so to enhance organizational learning, we're not seeing um, the same preventive opportunity from the majority of the workforce. And getting to violations, um, more or less the situation looked the same, but we had two more measures now here that we didn't achieve an 80% agreement. And those were uh, the mandatory leave, just to, to allow people, you know, um, relax and to, to decrease the emotional load and uh, uh, psychological burden after the event, and the administrative penalty. Still, measures one, two, and seven um, exist in the list. So we have five measures now here that we didn't achieve uh, an 80 percent agreement. And if you put them side by side and you you know um, see them there, you say, okay, yes, more or less, we don't have a huge difference between error and violation. However, when you put in a graph whether the same respondents attributed uh, the specific measures differently when it came to the case of error or violation, you can see that the cases of measures one and two, highly compared to the other, to the rest of the measures, where the ones where the same persons shifted their views more frequently when the case was an error or the case was a violation. And also we, we ran a few more statistics and we found that even different from different special uh, different specialties like you know pilots and engineers, ground services, and also depending on the year of service in the specific company had different perspectives. Of course, if someone wants can go back to the uh, publication to the paper to read more details, I would not have the time today to explain everything, but this is also important to, to keep in mind. And then we did the qualitative analysis and <clears throat> we found also some suggestions from the employees there, um, like what we should consider also uh, while uh, deciding uh, management and peers deciding about the measure, the most suitable one. So you see quite a rich list here. Uh, the three most frequent comments were about records of past performance, the severity of the event. So that was what they um, actually answered and the intention for a misconduct. Those were the most frequent um, comments we received. And further analysis, the employee suggested some additional measures like, as you can see on the slide, suspension after six months, safety training um, to suspend the license. But there were just few comments there. We cannot say that those represent um, the, the sum, the organization, and also some enhancement. Now, staying on this slide, for a bit more, we should not underestimate the case that we don't know uh, who those people were in our sample. So they could be managers, could be supervisors, they could be uh, pilots, engineers uh, at the front end, uh, meaning that any of those enhancements or additional measures, um, if, if it's a very like harsh measure like criminal prosecution in terms of violation, if this perspective is held, by a senior manager, then it can be, you know, something important to consider. But it was a fully anonymous uh, survey, and I cannot give more insights. So the overall message is out of this um, specific study. It is challenging. Whereas if you read books and papers uh, about just culture uh, and occupation, health and safety in general. Um, 
we, we tend to agree and we say, okay, yes, we need to have a just culture policy, but it's quite challenging to establish something that is commonly agreed. Um, the specific organization, the staff, uh, we are highly concerned about stigmatization. Um, so we need indeed to consider the context and intention there, which is hard to establish sometimes the intention behind actions and decisions. And also supported that we need to help people to reintegrate. So regardless of whether it was a violation or error, or whether um, we forgive something or we say, okay, we need to do something here, we still have to integrate people as uh, per the principles of uh, restorative culture. And the specific employees so that they didn't like the fact of, um, you know, distancing the end users from the working environment following an event. This is what they said. And they suggested some, um, as we saw before, uh, main recommendations to consider past performance. So this is quite, quite aligned with what literature says. That is a fair component. However, they were quite deterministic. They say the worst, the outcome, the worst, the implications would be, which is not according to the literature, but it's something that the workforce believes. So the question here is, do we try to, to push the workforce in another direction to see that our world is not that deterministic, that the same conditions and behaviors can have different outcomes, or do we respect that and then we adjust our just culture policy accordingly? So those are big questions there. And the errors were just in a less strict manner than violations, which also more or less agrees with what literature has um, included. And somebody would ask, does it really matter? Should we ask the people about the measures and whether they agree or not, or what ideas they might have? Well, if we want to um, establish an environment where we respect diversity and we include different perspectives and we show you know, that we appreciate and, and we value everyone, yes. This is the way forward. And um, management of diversity is very important. It's hard to achieve. Once more, we cannot um, accommodate everyone. We cannot keep everyone happy, but we must put um, efforts towards that. And just takeaways from this um, presentation, just culture is not a checklist. It's not if, then, else. It's not like if you do that, this happens next. And it's not binary. So the implementation of the policy itself um, must be uh, supported by the workforce. It can be, um, it is feasible and achievable, but reconciling different perspectives can be challenging. It is necessary. Once more, you cannot keep everyone happy. And we must also keep into mind that what we perceive as just today might not be the case in a year from now or five years from now. As the workforce changes, as ourselves change over time, this means that we must be also able to adjust the just cultural policy. This, of course, doesn't mean that we're going to run a survey and do a referendum um, every six months or every year. But it's something we must keep in mind. It can be, you know, you can decide. It could be five years. It could be any other uh, periodicity you prefer. And it could be nice to um, inform job applicants. I mean, I have seen, um, you know, plenty of um, contracts and enterprises agreements. And uh, uh, most of the people are uh, ignorant about what the just cultural policy of the organization is in case of you know, any trouble there. So that's the picture. That's that's actually justness, as I said before, is something very sensitive. So I think we should know before entering an organization. And also, if 
just culture remains in the boundaries of occupational health and safety, it's not going to be that effective. So just culture falls under the over organizational, uh, you know, culture and organization psychology has dealt heavily with that. So despite the fact that we um, um, visit just culture only after big serious events in occupational health and safety, we must not underestimate that justness is an organizational trait. It's not only about safety events. So, you know, I'm going to share with you for a minute an example. A few weeks ago, I had um, <clears throat> a dinner with, uh, with friends in a restaurant here in, in Brisbane. And the the way they responded for our table, we were about 20 people around the table, it was a birthday actually party, was trying their best to, you know, to take the orders, to inform us about the menu there. And um, it was um, at around, it was an evening, um, so eight, nine o'clock. So I saw her running left and right also to uh, serve other tables. It happened that uh, I saw also, um, I yeah, I saw her entering our order um, in a terminal. I, I assume that this would then transfer our order to, to the kitchen. So everything was going fine. We uh, enjoyed our starters. And um, when it was the time for the main, this is everyone got, you know, the food, but I was left without anything. So I was just waiting there, nothing was coming. And then the waiter came to me and said, you know, um, I'm terribly sorry while typing, you know, the order I just, you know, made the mistake, I didn't um, enter your, this, your order. And they said, oh, it's fine because there was plenty of food on the table and everyone invited me to, you know, to share. So, okay. No problems from my side. When it was time to, to pay the bill, the waiter came to me and said, just to, to show, you know, um, that um, I'm really sorry. We are really sorry about the mistake. You're not going to pay anything for, you know, tonight. And they said, oh, that's very kind of you. And after a minute, I said, okay, that was very, um, you know, that was a courtesy. but." Who's going to pay for that? I mean, I I wonder, okay, is this the organizational, I mean, now the restaurant policy, or is something that the waiter is going to, you know, to undertake? And I, um, I approach here and say, okay, who is going to pay, in, in brackets, uh, for my cost? Are you? Or is it management policy? And say, no, I'm going to. Say, no, this cannot happen. Because I could see the waiter stressed, running around, trying to do her best to serve everyone, including our table. And they say, no, this isn't just. If this would be a management policy, taking into account the circumstances and the you know, busy time, during the evening dinner, then I would accept it. But I would not accept that an end user, because made this mistake, should suffer the consequences. And I actually asked the manager kindly and, you know, uh, far from others and say, you know, if uh, for any reason I would not come back to your restaurant and enjoy the delicious food, would be because you're not just, and they explain the situation. So was that about safety? No, had nothing to do about safety. And if you have a just culture about occupational health and safety, which is a great start, then you need to engage other areas of your organization, like quality, security, and of production, and make your occupation health and safety as a proxy to you know to instigate just culture across the organization and just as a final remark for today 
Um, in one of the accounts, one of the stories uh, shared in a, a book we recently published, which includes more than 30, 30 stories, inconvenient ones, but also successful, about safety. This is a quote from, uh, from my chapter, where I share my experience with a specific um, um, event uh, during my professional career. And we need to understand that if we don't have just culture at the organizational level, something agreed, defined, um, and implemented uh, with the best of the intentions and effectively, the system will still find ways to um, apply justness in lower levels. Maybe the senior management uh, ourselves would be ignorant what's going on at the lower levels, but justness will be applied to some degree and somehow. So thank you um, so much for your attendance. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Nectarius. Um, and yes, we'll certainly take audience questions now. So please type your questions into uh, the questions pane. And just to let you know, uh, Nectarios, uh, one of the audience members, um, thank you for the example that you just provided. Thank you very much as well. So a question, uh, Nectarios. What do you mean by a bottom-up approach for implementation of a just culture? Can you provide an example? Yes. Um, what I mean here is the typical consultation approach with the workforce when we want to establish um, something that um, regards, you know, the whole organization. We're talking about um, discussions with uh, representatives of the workforce or directly with the workforce, depending on the structure. So organizations that have health and safety representatives. Um, we can have also um, the unions involved, why not? Um, but generally speaking, uh, bottom-up means that we collect, we respect, and we try to accommodate as many perspectives as possible. Uh, when we establish, when we draw, um, when we draft our just culture policy. Now, the implementation itself means once more that it's not one woman, one man show to make a decision, but it must be um, a panel with uh, where everyone is represented. It could be the manager, could be the supervisor, could be a couple of peers to give context and to give the perspectives. I hope I answered the question. Thank you, Nectarios. Another question. Can you recommend a particular generic just culture policy that our business could use or use as a template? Um, I'm not aware of any template uh, because I think it's, um, it's very... I understand that many companies want a template, like, you know, to adjust to their needs. Um, they are guidelines how to establish the just culture policy, um, but I haven't seen any template because I guess each organization is different, has different workforce composition, different complexity of operations, envelope of activities. Um, imagine that we're talking now, of course, in Australia, but that was a study back in the European, um, you know, context, different country. Um, so yes, I could share, and you can you can find guidelines how to, um, which steps you can follow to establish. But I haven't come across any template per se. Thanks, Nectarios, and there's still time to. Uh submit uh, any questions that you have uh, for our presenter today. Uh, Nectarios, um, please write your questions in uh, the questions window. Um, another question, uh, Nectarios, can just culture be implemented by a management team that is perceived as single-minded? How would you suggest implementing when such circumstance exists? 
that's a very interesting uh, question. Well, to, you know, frankly speaking, if there is single mind in management teams, I would say that imposes that applies to just culture policy. There's no just culture there. It's it, it's it's a very fundamental ingredient of a just culture policy that it accommodates different views and is applied by uh, a panel with representatives across all organizational levels. So it, for me, this goes back to what I said that just culture is not a checklist, top-down approach. So yes, I cannot associate single-minded management with just culture policy. I'm sorry. I cannot see how those can go together. Thank you, Nectarios. Um, just to let everyone know, the uh, webinar is being recorded and uh, will be made available on the WorkSafe Tasmania YouTube page. So uh, a question uh, has come through Nectarios. Does the accountability of a PCBU inform decisions around safety breaches more so than an employee group who may prioritise job security of a colleague over promoting a safe work environment and reduce risk? In other words, management may be more inclined to discipline than employees. Yes, this can be the case. That's why you need to bring everyone around the table. When drafting and finalizing your just culture policy, and when implementing that. Yes, we understand the different roles and interests in organizations, and I'm not blaming management because they can be more, you know, uh, let's say towards discipline and a bit more harsh, and we cannot also underestimate the interest and we cannot blame the workers of wanting to secure that um, nobody is going to get dismissed or going to suffer consequences disproportional to what happened. So once more, this is the way forward. Um, we need to bring together the PCBU and actually we're talking about the officers who have, you know, this due diligence um, obligations together with other persons in the organization, including the HR sometimes, including the occupational health and safety um, staff, supervisors and, and workers to, to establish something. If this, which is the, the foundation, um, is not uh, followed, then whatever just cultural policy we claim we have, it's going to be unjust. In age, I mean by default or seen as a just, you know, by the workforce. Thank you, Nectarios. There's still time to submit any questions um, for our presenter, Professor. Associate Professor Nectarios Karanikas. Also, WorkSafe Month webinars are running throughout October, so please do head to the WorkSafe TAS Month website to see what, uh, what other events we have running throughout October. With no further questions coming through Nectarios, I'll close the uh, webinar. So thank you, Associate Professor Nectarios Karanikas from Queensland University of Technology. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Just Culture in Practice. Is there a fine line between preventive and punitive measures? At the close of the webinar, you will receive a survey to complete. We do appreciate you providing your feedback to us. Today's webinar has also been recorded and will be made available on the WorkSafe 
Tasmania YouTube page. On behalf of WorkSafe Tasmania and the WorkCover Tasmania Board, thank you for joining us and thank you, Nectarios. Thank you as well. Have a nice afternoon, everyone.